Yeah, welcome everyone to our monthly ICG Lab Talk series. Uh, thanks for coming, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Harald Piringer today. Harald is the head of the Visual Analysis Group at VRV's Research Center. It's a research center in Vienna. And Harald did his master's and PhD thesis at Vienna University of Technology. And he also uh, finished his education even with the Sub Auspices Presidentialis. So I guess you have a nice ring at home. Um, and Harald's research interests include visual analytics for simulation and statistical modeling. And Harald is going to talk today about visualization for applications in engineering industry and engineering, energy industry and engineering. Thank you, Harald. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon from my side. Yeah, uh, no need to introduce myself further. Uh, so let's briefly say something about what is VRVIS. VRVIS is a non-university research center. Um, as Mark said, we are located in Vienna. We were founded in the year 2000 uh, and comprise overall something about 70 researchers. Uh, our basic mission is to do knowledge transfer uh, from basic research to industrial applications. Basically, this is also how the title of the talk fits. And uh, uh, we do it in several, uh, we do it in several disciplines, uh, broad range of uh, disciplines uh, for computer graphics, also uh, with a dedicated focus on geometric modeling, biomedical imaging, and visual analytics, uh, which I underline because this is actually uh, my area of research. Um, and this is what we will be hearing about uh, something talk today. Uh, in order to understand a bit of uh, this uh, application-oriented project, uh, this is the focus of VRVIS. So collaborating with industry, this is kind of a nice to have uh, for most industrial settings, but it's a must have for our settings, also due to uh, the way how the funding scheme of the VRVIS works. So basically we don't have any base funding, but every funding and money we have is directly or indirectly related to a project where uh, the company partners will pay something for it. And this is something uh, that's uh, how it's quite fundamentally different from uh, yeah, how research works in most university settings. Talking about visual analytics, uh, I think that some of you will be familiar with the term, uh, but nevertheless, I thought I'd give you a short uh, summary of what it is. So according to a definition from, from the year 2010, visual, visual analysis automated analysis techniques with interactive visualization for an efficient understanding, reasoning, and decision making on the basis of very large and complex data sets. Uh, it's quite uh, multidisciplinary. Uh, in addition to visualization, there is a strong component uh, related to data mining, data management, human perception, cognition, and several others. Um, of course, uh, it's quite open with respect to the applications and very open with respect to the data modalities. For example, there's visual analytics for textual data, for media data, and all sorts of data. Our focus in my, in my group is uh, visual analytics for high dimensional and time dependent data. This is also where the uh, application examples that we'll see later on refer to. So, who is we? Um, as Mark said, uh, I'm uh, lucky to be a head of a uh, research group in Sydney via this. Uh, overall, we're about uh, nine heads, um, not counting students. We're the top six heads, uh, are full time employees, and the three heads uh, on the bottom uh, are part time employees. Uh, so, basically, uh, we have collaborating with industry partners from various uh, disciplines. Um, uh, our focus currently is on four application areas. Uh, the application area that uh, is the largest in terms of the number of participating companies and also with respect to the budget is the energy sector, uh, where we have also a collaboration. Uh, first one here, Parkcom, which serves as a distribution partner for software to uh, end users like, for example, they put a few labels up here, like, for example, uh, Green Energy and, and others in Germany. Um, 
to really distribute the software as a kind of a product to them. Um, more recently, uh, but, uh, we have a growing focus on applications in industrial manufacturing. Uh, this RHI, maybe some of you, uh, some of you know, it's a large Austrian company where we have an intensive collaboration with them. Uh, historically, the oldest uh, application domain of my group is on automotive engineering. Uh, we started with a collaboration with ABL about something like 10 years ago, and uh, this is still an ongoing collaboration uh, yes, as fruitful as ever. And uh, application domain uh, with healthcare planning, uh, not dealing with biomedical data, uh, but really uh, data referring to the healthcare system as a whole. So, kind of uh, distribution uh, of, of, of diseases over the population and its development over time, questions to this sort. Uh, there are also several parts involved with the Hauptverband der österreichischen Sozialversicherungsindustrie, and we being the biggest. And we have some other uh, applications, in, uh, like for example, uh, recently we had a project in the School of Network uh, Monitoring. Uh, <coughs> I would say that those four application domains is quite the best that we are doing. Um, and uh, in this talk, I will mostly be focusing on uh, applications from the energy sector and from automotive engineering. Um, well, there are kind of standards, there are several models uh, how the process of data analysis, uh, which uh, of the steps that are involved with the process of data uh, analysis. And typically, one of the first steps is data quality, uh, checking data quality. So, I try to assemble here a few questions that really recur uh, quite. Uh, cross-cutting various application domains um, and typically one of the most important and the first of them is the data quality. So is the data quality sufficient for correct interpretation? The quality may refer to, for example, missing values, outliers or other structural problems of the data that in some kind uh, may uh, render to, uh, results of analysis implausible or uh, in other ways usable. Um, another uh, important question is, does the data reveal any unexpected trends and relationships and other patterns and outliers? And uh, this is typically directly linked to a uh, follow-up question because often users do not only want to uh, get some insights from the data, but um, in our context uh, it's often the case that people want to model create some kind of model. This might be a statistical model, a regression model, a symmetry, but this might also be a simulation model. But they want to model this in some kind of they are interested in how can this simulation support this modeling process. Uh, once you have uh, created the model, uh, one application would be to uh, evaluate this model for different uh, scenarios, and uh, it's directly links to the uh, follow-up question of decision making. Yeah, how to use uh, data from multiple scenarios for efficient decision making. Uh, last but not least, uh, for all kinds of insights uh, and decisions, uh, typically the analysts or the, the, the users, they need to communicate their insights and decisions in some way. And uh, typically, uh, what most of uh, people agree, 3D pipe. Charts is typically not the best, even this is still uh, one of the uh, utilization types that first come into the mind of most users. So, yeah, let's try to do it better than that. So, I would say that those five uh, recurring questions, of course, are not everything, uh, but they are uh, very frequent and kind of match to. Uh, certain tasks, certain high level tasks that uh, we try uh, to address. And the vision is to have a system that basically tries to uh, address these. This is data quality assessment and cleansing, uh, exploratory data analysis, model building and validation, 
multi-criteria decision-making and reporting. And I try to structure my talk uh, with respect to these high-level tasks. Um, I start with a quality assessment uh, in an energy uh, uh, in the energy sector, um, the users typically need to deal with uh, very many time series. This time series may relate to uh, energy consumption, energy production, but typically it also involves uh, time series regarding to uh, meteorological time series, prices, and others uh, as well. And when you have a large number of time series, it can be quite challenging to get an overview of potential data points. And uh, with this introduction, I want uh, to show a short video uh, illustrating a visualization technique which we call this laws. And um, Demonstrates this clause, a visual approach for data quality assessment. Real world data is often afflicted by data quality problems such as zero values, missing values, and outliers. Data checks are commonly used for detecting such data quality problems, but how can justified indications be distinguished from false positives? And how can users obtain an efficient overview that scales to dozens of checks on hundreds of data entries? This clause addresses these challenges to support multiple use cases. In this example, the data set comprises the production of 95 photovoltaic power plants, as well as dozens of meteorological measurements. We want to assess the data quality of this data set for downstream tasks like modeling or clustering. The assessment is based on the results of a predefined set of plausibility checks. This clause initially provides a compact and intentionally simple overview by aggregating all checks. 254 checks have indications for some part of the data, and 148 data attributes are affected by indications overall. In the indication frequency column, stacked bars show the overall percentage of data records with and without check indications. Small triangles show the percentage of affected data records for each other class. <coughs> For example, constraint violation, missing, and anomaly. We use scale stacked bar charts to ensure the visibility for each order of magnitude while using a linear scaling for fast interpretation. But which data attributes are affected by which indications? A hierarchical definition of table rows enables to define according drill downs instantly. Sorting the rows by their percentage of affected data records reveals that some power plants have many novels hours. Users can now define further drill downs. Clicking on the plus sign defines a local drill down by check classification for that data attribute. This problem is apparently comprise missing values, a few consecutive non-zero duplicates, and zero production during daytime. The hierarchical definition of rows is very flexible. For example, all nodes of one hierarchy level can simultaneously be expanded and collapsed. Likewise, the hierarchy levels can be reordered by a drag and drop. This reveals missing as the most frequent type of anomaly, followed by zero at daytime. This plot supports multiple types of columns. An additional column shows the distribution of the indications over time. Centered rectangles represent the proportion of indicated data records per month. For example, we see that zero at daytime occurs particularly often after July 2010. Expanding this row shows that only a few power plants have indications in the entire period. Also, most plants have indications in January and February, but not all of them. Resizing columns affects the shown level of detail. Additionally, hover triggered control elements like sliders allow to modify the shown range. Most power plants have zero production on January 24th. Additional distortion enables to locally increase the degree of detail even further. In general, this clause is intended as one important element in the process of data quality assessment. Our implementation is integrated as a part of a comprehensive
comprehensive visual analytics system providing several visualization types is linked to use. Selecting the indicated data records of January 24 for one power plant in this pause allows an assessment with context in the time series view. Also, the values of indications are shown as text in the table. Inspecting the entire time series confirms the date is the beginning of a longer period. As another example, occurrences of non zero production at nighttime can be inspected in the same manner. Looking at details for the two effective power plants shows that one of them has values only marginally above zero, maybe due to slight isolation nearby. The second power plant seems to have significant offset for a long period of time. This law supports the discretized positive positive chips. Multiple thresholds may, for example, be used to distinguish different levels of severity and make sure this additional problem. In this example, we see that the anomalies are classified as uncritical for one plant and as critical for the other. To fill the first use case, we gain much information about data quality problems in short time. Overall, the data quality seems sufficient for downstream tasks like modeling or clustering. However, steps like suitable data subsets seem necessary, and some errors require further investigation. Okay, as a second uh, example, so this first, uh, uh, this first use case showed um, a no novel visualization for data quality assessment. Uh, as a second example, I want to briefly uh, show something that uh, a real use case where we were um, confronted with a problem in modeling a particular time series. <coughs> we, had a, we had a time series. Um, uh, that basically uh, a customer in the energy sector wanted to do a prediction uh, for one of its own clients. And it turns out that uh, the, the power consumption of the client was hard to model uh, with automated uh, modeling techniques, automatic uh, regression modeling techniques. Uh, and it wasn't obviously, uh, it wasn't obvious why this was the case. And so basically they contacted us uh, in order that we look at the data and if we can explain uh, what actually um, makes the data so hard to construct a good regression model for it. Um, and uh, I think this is a quite simple example, uh, but nevertheless, Okay. This is a quite simple example, but nevertheless, uh, it shows what visualization can do with real benefit. And actually, it's, uh, it was um, yeah, quite convincing to many people in the energy sector. So, the time series needs to be modeled. And we have quite a small list of features. So, basically, this is a power load. And we have other features, like, for example, temperature or precipitation. But the power load itself, it's uh, the power load over two years. And uh, we see some kind of a seasonal trend here. And just looking at this uh, time series plot and zooming into it, uh, we also see something like uh, daily patterns. Um, obviously, there are some days, uh, but um, we also see some weekly pattern. Uh, so there is some regularity in the data, uh, where it's not immediately obvious why this is so hard to predict. Um, basically, what we did is we plotted each uh, day, the, the graph of each day on top of each other. Yeah? This is basically what you see here. So when you look at the uh, calendar up here, you see this view up here, the calendar, you see here all the graphs is 2013, up here all 2014, and each, uh, each rectangle here corresponds to one day, and covering the rectangle will highlight the respective day. And, and looking at the, this ensemble of graphs, you see that here, obviously, especially in the afternoon, when the 
late afternoon, uh, there is one bundle going up and another bundle going down. Yeah? And uh, using brushing, you can now just draw a simple brush here. And with this simple brush, you see in the blend of view, that basically, obviously, one bundle corresponds to a time starting uh, some kind of mid of May and goes until uh, mid of September. And this seems to be quite the same for two consecutive for both two consecutive years. And this uh, insight told the ones, uh, the, statistic, the statisticians that try to model the data, that obviously this client seems to have two operating modes. Yeah? It's an industry company, and they seem to have two operating modes, yeah? maybe to some um, uh, client uh, installation. And knowing this, they could add this information as additional feature and model the data separately for these two years. And this uh, led to a significant improvement in the prediction accuracy of the uh, regarding model. Yeah. And uh, it is a simple example. It's, it, it, there's nothing fancy about it from a visualization perspective. But nevertheless, it's exactly kind of types of insights that really do pay off because uh, having the model uh, more accurate, this may mean uh, up to millions of viewers to an end user. Yeah. So basically, in this way, it's quite uh, arguable to end users what benefit uh, some possible. Okay, um, let's take this because we will be switching to a video immediately again. As a third example, uh, we stay with regression modeling. Uh, in the past few years, we um, yeah, had a bit of a focus on regression modeling. Uh, motivated by not only the energy sector but also the automotive industry, and uh, in this context especially also the uh, feature uh, detection, because um, many uh, many users in the energy sector approach this with a question similar to: We have some kind of a target uh, time series, and we want to understand, for example, the production of some power plant, and we want to understand uh, on what on which factors uh, does this production depend on and uh, how, in which way, yeah, which can be seen as a regression problem and uh, yeah, create an interactive approach to address such questions. Let me show you this in the second video. We present a partition-based framework for building and validating regression models. Our framework helps users to understand relationships between observed variables and code features in a dependent quantitative target area. Without finding the most useful features for explaining the targets using a regression model. Also, existing regression models can be validated and should be compared using our framework. Framework consists of interactive mode views, an overview of relationships between the target variable and every single feature, and an overview of relationships between the target and pairs of features, allowing users to analyze the tendencies of pairwise interactions. Each overview provides a ranking of features and feature pairs according to the relevance for the target. Visualizations of the target over the domain of each feature show the qualitative structure of relationships. The sequence of the plots is determined by the relevance ranking, ensuring that the most relevant plots are displayed on top. This provides visual scalability for large numbers of features and uses can interactively change the ranking criteria in real time. The key aspect of our framework is that we partition each of the one or two dimensional feature subspaces into disjoint regions. Aggregate all data items within each region. In 1D, the vertical axis of each plot is used to show percentiles and mean of the target within each region. In 2D, the mean value or variance of the target is color coded across the domain of the two features. The framework provides different partitioning and layouting modes for many different aspects of relationships, such as the shape, size, and significance of structures. In summary, the framework provides ranked visual overviews focusing the user on potentially useful features first. The structure of relationships is conveyed by the visualization. We are now going to demonstrate how the framework can be applied for interactive regression. The target variable is a measured consumption of natural gas, as needed for PT. The analyst wants to build a regression model to predict this consumption. The ranked overview of single features shows that the target is strongly related to the feature's temperature and day of year. The ranking in this example is computed by fitting a piecewise linear model for each feature. Assessing its goodness of it. 
community of relationships, the goodness of getting some fusions of different power complexities and reason for left to right. In this case, temperature seems to be more stable than day of year, as it potentially explains the target even when using a low power complexity. Temperature is chosen as the first feature for regression. As the analyst wants to use a simple linear prediction model, but the visualization indicates a non-linear relationship, square the cubic occurrences of the temperature are used for fitting as well. The regression model is trained, and the residuals of the model are used as the new target, which updates all rankings and visualizations. The effect of the temperature is captured by the model. Its relevance for the target is reduced. The visualizations now show the local distribution of residuals across the domain of features. Structural patterns of features now indicate a systematic bias by not taking these features into account. Guided by these plots, another relevant feature is selected, making the prediction model two-dimensional. As additional features are considered in the model, more subtle effects emerge that were previously masked by other more dominating effects, such as the dependency of the wind speed. It seems surprising that this highly structured dependency of the wind speed is not meant to the model. Switching the layout of regions to a frequency preserving mode shows that the indicated trend is not very significant, as very few high wind speeds have been observed. Now, two dimensional interactions of features are considered. The coloring of the plots shows the local prediction bias of the model. In other words, it shows a local tendency of over or underestimating the target. Structural patterns of the coloring, such as systematic errors, by not accounting for these effects correctly. The top ranking interaction of temperature and day of year shows that the same temperature will appear to yield different consumptions depending on the period of the year. This indicates that an interaction of the two features should be included for accurate prediction. Another interaction pattern appears at high wind speeds and low temperatures. The analyst chooses now for its wind chill factor and adds the two interaction to the bottom. The model is updated and the effect is captured. A further subtle relation, such as an apparent dependency on the categorical feature day of the week. During all model refinement steps, a quantitative model overview keeps track of the prediction improvement caused by each extension step. Micro steps relative to the previous refinement if they are not satisfied with an extension. As soon as no substantial improvement can be achieved anymore, the user terminates the workflow, ending up with a multi-dimensional prediction model for the target. Our system can then be used for follow up tasks such as detailed validation using slices of the identified model. Okay. Now you've seen three examples from uh, work in the energy sector. Um, a fourth example. Uh, I want to give an example from uh, automotive engineering. Uh, in this context, uh, we're dealing with multi-run simulation data. Yeah? So basically, uh, when engineers construct an engine, first of all, they build a model which you can numerically simulate. And uh, typically, they don't run a single simulation run, but they vary parameters, which we refer to, uh, to um, environmental conditions, as well as to uh, degrees of freedom that the engineer has, and basically sample this kind of parameter space in order to get something like 120,000 simulation runs, which enables them to assess some, uh, how, the, how different uh, parameter settings, which impact they have on the results which need to be expected. Uh, in this context, there are, again, several, uh, several tasks, like, for example, uh, uh, sensitivity analysis, feature detection, also model building is important in this context. Uh, but what I want to show now as a uh, fourth example is some kind of a qualitative, qualitative assessment uh, of simulation results. Because the simulations don't need to be, uh, they are not guaranteed to produce uh, always meaningful results or results that, that match the intuition of the engineers. Uh, but sometimes the simulations on not well parameterized or uh, in other way uh, do not behave uh, in a physically realistic way and um, uh, for these cases it's important that the engineer kind of uh, assesses and validates the simulations uh, for further tasks and uh, as a special challenge for visualization the result of the simulation they may have different characteristics it may be as simple as certain scalar values but it may also be, for example, a time series or even uh, uh, something like a 
to the scalar field, which we have seen this example. Yes. In this case, um, there were 100 uh, simulation runs uh, of, a, of a circle of bearing. So basically, it's a simulation the circle of bearing in the engine. Uh, and uh, there are parameters. What you see down here is uh, basically that three parameters have been married, which uh, corresponds to the axis of this parallel coordinate plot here. Uh, and uh, two of these three parameters are also mapped to the axis of the scatter plot. So basically, each uh, point here corresponds to one simulation run. And what you see here is uh, as one type of uh, result of such a simulation, we have something like a time series, like for example here, uh, an acceleration value uh, over time uh, at a particular position of this engine. And uh, for the engine years, uh, it's, very, um, it's a very good overview in which we see uh, which kind of vari variability is there in the data, and also to link back and forth the parameter space and the result space. So for example, uh, asking the question, uh, which parameter combinations cause uh, such spikes like you see here? It's as simple as drawing a brush here and getting uh, their respective parameter combinations uh, in the other fields. Of course, similar, likewise, we can also define, uh, for example, a brush here and say, uh, which variability can I expect if I uh, use, if I set a certain parameter, uh, to, uh, to a certain value or compliance in a certain heat above. Um, so, uh, something like one E function is one type of complex simulation results. But we all have multiples. For example, here we have trajectories. Um, when we see that, for example, here, uh, these increasing values. Uh, for this parameter radial clearance here, we see that the size of these trajectories uh, is increasing as well. And uh, we also have, as I said before, pressure distributions, which could be extracted as a kind of a 2D uh, scalar field. So basically, it's a distribution of pressure inside a circular bearing uh, where uh, one of the uh, one of the axes of such a 2D field. It's basically the angle of the using this bearing, and the other is the um, width of the bearing. And uh, what we have developed here is a visualization technique to uh, visualize such ensembles of uh, 2D functions. Uh, you see here to the left uh, is basically kind of a scatter block that uh, represents each. Um, Simulation, uh, the simulation to be function in a small height field, and uh, the position of the height field corresponds to uh, certain aggregates, like for example, the maximum on the y axis and the volume on the x axis. And for example, looking at uh, some examples here, you see that uh, in 3D uh, they show a quite smooth shape. Um, but on the other hand, if we show a look at the example to the right, we see that here, some three examples, uh, we see that here we have certain spikes. Yeah? And those spikes, uh, uh, an engineer would assess such spikes as simulation artifacts, which, um, which is why such visualizations are important for a qualitative assessment of such data. And it's also now possible uh, to kind of explain uh, which parameter combinations cause such artifacts mm -hmm. by simply uh, selecting them. And you see that uh, looking at the parallel coordinate block, you basically see that uh, for the first two parameters, uh, uh, this uh, take um, the selected subset basically takes any values for the first two uh, parameters. But, uh, has only high values for the search parameter. Now uh, we could try to uh, assess that and say the search parameter is force k. So we could, for example, now assign this uh, search parameter force k to the x axis of this view, and then we we'll really see how the maximum seems to depend uh, on the setting of this parameter force k. And looking at the spikes, looking at this plot down here, 
um, we can zoom into this a bit, we see that the spikes obviously seem to occur at different uh, positions within this 2D domain. Uh, so there seem to be one here and, and uh, several spikes. And um, by basically zooming into it furthermore, uh, we are now restricting the computation of the aggregates to this part of this uh, 2D domain. And we see that only several of the simulations have this spike. Well, actually, um, for example, other simulations are showing spikes at this location, and uh, again, other simulations are showing spikes at this location. So basically, it's not all uh, not all uh, parameter combinations resulted in the same spikes. And uh, yeah, these are quite complex insights that basically engineers um, without such visualization techniques would not be able to. Um, yeah. Okay, um, and very briefly, um, maybe I just talk about this verbally, uh, discuss the time, so that we have some time. One second, please. Um, and as a fifth example, uh, uh, a recently developed utilization technique from us, um, the open collaboration is Mark, is uh, called Weightlifter. And basically, what this utilization technique does is that it supports multi uh, criteria decision making. Uh, because actually, we are again in the context of application data, of, of engineering data. Um, so again, we have lots of simulation runs, and one ultimate purpose why the simulations are conducted are, uh, is to find a sweet spot in the parameter space uh, of the engineer. And the sweet spot uh, this is typically not uh, uniquely defined. This has multiple objectives, like for example, we want to maximize the generated torque of the engine, but for example, we want to minimize some emission gases. And uh, typically, each of these uh, simulations has different uh, characteristics of the results. And uh, by extending the technique lineup by Mark and Sam, basically, we uh, extended it in a way to visualize the entire space of possible weightings that you can assign to these various objectives uh, to see, for example, how stable a particular decision is with respect to the weights that you assign to it. Or in other ways, if you uh, set your preferences for objectives differently, um, what results would you get and how could you vary these preferences that you stay with the same, um, uh, that you get the final, you make the final decision. Okay, um, I intentionally uh, skipped further examples to discuss the time. Uh, so far, I talked about applications in the energy sector and in automotive engineering. Uh, as I said before, uh, we all have applications in industrial quality management. Um, if you're interested in them, I would like to refer uh, you to a quite recent uh, video. Uh, one this is in German, and this is not directly uh, directed at uh, a scientific uh, scientific audience, but rather an application-oriented audience. But nevertheless, I think it nicely uh, shows two application examples of uh, visual analytics in uh, the field of industrial quality management. Okay. Um, before I come to a conclusion, uh, let me say one slide about uh, uh, our software platform. Basically, all the examples that you have seen, all the videos and all the live demos, uh, is based on one common software platform, which is called Explore. Uh, Explore, sorry, Explore. Uh, this stands for Visualization System for Exploratory Data Analysis, and it's basically an extensible software framework that's written in C++ with a small item layer on top of it. Um, initially, uh, this floor was intended as a 
quite flexible uh, tool for expert users. Yeah? So uh, followed a quite simple scheme. You could load in some data, and afterwards uh, you had quite the flexibility to open new visualizations like scatter plots, parent coordinates, and so on and so forth. Define some selections, derived data attributes, and many other things. Uh, the problem is uh, it was quite overwhelming most users. In this context, maybe I should say that. Uh, our users uh, from our application are typically not scientists. Yeah? So actually, ex we exploratory data analysis is typically not part of their normal workflow. Yeah? Probably in contrast to scientists, like for example, um, uh, the work of Mark is addressing. And for them, this, quite, this was more simply they said, no, it's too complex for us. We want to familiarize with all this. Um, and, um, was not so much not so well uh, adopted. This is why we changed our strategy about three years ago and uh, said, okay, we <coughs> now focus it more as a platform, as a, as a tool for rapid prototyping of uh, analytic task specific dashboards where basically end users directly get a ready made dashboard uh, that matches a certain task that makes sense to them. And actually, this is much, much uh, better. Uh, received by the audience and currently we are having dashboards for all of the application areas already that they showed to you before and based on such uh, interactive dashboards we're also uh, about to generate products like we already have one in the energy sector. Okay, uh, in the final three slides I try to summarize some lessons that I personally, so this, this is very personal. Yeah, so there's no uh, claim of, of, of uh, that it's um, generally valid, um, but a kind of a personal subjective reflection on some lessons learned from uh, the past 10 years of trying to do projects with uh, industry partners in several domains. Um, First of all, I think most of them are having a quite positive attitude towards visualization, which is actually good news. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is a significant gap still between uh, what the scientific community uh, would consider as innovative and what end users would consider as, as innovative. Um, now, there are some tools like, for example, Tableau that uh, already um, and uh, what uh, it, it kind of raised the expectation for its visualization a bit, also maybe some interactive web graphics. But uh, when we uh, are talking about tools that are, for example, specific to applications in energy or uh, in industry, you typically still see some static graphics. And this is exactly what end users associate with visualization. So the typical understanding of visualization is still a means for presenting something, not really for gaining insights, but for presenting something by using having more or less static reports. And uh, visual analysis is a concept that is much less known to most people. Um, and achieving adoption by users who are uh, involved in an operational and setting who have the permanent stress of uh, needing to deliver some reports to some um, uh, to some decision maker um, and have some regular repetitive tasks is not really easy. Yeah? It's still possible, but it's not easy because there's very little time for familiarization with new visualization concepts. And uh, typically, it's quite okay, for example, for an evaluation section of a paper to find some domain expert. They are willing to, uh, to look at your visualization and give some feedback. But having them really uh, adopt your visualization on a regular basis is quite hard. And one reason uh, for this is uh, exactly that their understanding of visualization is such, uh, because they are seeing it as a kind of a way for communicating inside, but not so much for uh, uh, for finding new insights. Um, a second lesson learned that's uh, very closely related to the first one is if you want to have any chance uh, of having your users adopt uh, your tools, 
you need quite a seamless integration of their IT ecosystem and workflow. Yeah? So it must be very simple for them to import <coughs> data and also to export your results. This can be images, this can be uh, transformed data, maybe models. Uh, it might be, it, it should be, uh, it must be very simple to them for them to see a real benefit uh, of this. The, the more um, fuzzy the results get, you it just we have some generated insight, uh, the more harder it is for them to really have them use your tools on a regular basis. Um, yeah, and uh, as a third lesson uh, learned is, and this is also maybe a contrast to, uh, uh, this kind of generates a kind of a conflict with the situation as a visualization researcher. Um, typically, as visualization researchers, we are quite used to seeing complex visualizations and interpreting visualizations that um, change very rapidly when you do some interaction. But uh, for end users, there are very many end users that, that are really scared of complexity. Yeah? They don't want to see complexity, they want to see plots that they know. Yeah? And they are not willing to follow the visualization, for example, during uh, some interactive Russian tasks changing very, very rapidly. They have been trained for interpreting a static image for maybe several minutes and uh, showing them something that's highly interactive and where everything is changing all the time is quite scary to them. Yeah. So basically, visualizations must be easy and fast to understand or they will fail. Um, one partial aspect of this is also that sometimes domain conventions beat. Uh, known proven perceptions of priority. So I create a show this example down here. Uh, for me as a visualization research, it would be quite easy to argue why the right image, the right representation of a uh, 2D hate field is superior to the left one for several reasons. And still uh, when you talk to real engineers, nine out of ten will probably uh, prefer the image on the left hand side. Convincing them the right, that the one on the right hand side is actually superior, this is not an easy task. Um, yeah, visual solution should directly match real users tasks. This is goes hand in hand with what I said before about the dashboard lesson. And uh, also this configure everything to the kids. Uh, they kind of try to overburden end users, uh, so keep it as simple as Okay, with this I want to thank you for your attention. I was not too much over time, one to five minutes. I hope that's okay. Still some minutes for discussion and yeah, looking forward to your questions. Yeah, thank you, Howard. Okay, before we start with the questions here, there's one remote question I want to ask um, on the YouTube stream. So the question is, do you run into cases where the data set is too large to be visualized because it would be too demanding for the machine? And if so, how do you deal with it? Mm. Well, uh, I would answer that uh, if, you have, if, you really, if it really comes to scalability, you have numerous issues, but uh, typically you have three strategies to deal with it. You can aggregate it, you can filter it, or you can sample it. Yeah? And, uh, which one is, is the best one depends on the task that you want to do. If you want, for example, some outlier detection sampling, it will probably not be the best one. Um, but you could need some kind of other uh, feature detection. But uh, actually, um, in our cases, um, typically the data sets that we experience, for example, in the energy sector, they are something the size of uh, few um, up to a few million data records so it's not really big data um, or extremely big data and in this context it's typically well proven to have something like an aggregated overview and uh, detailed visualizations where you can really drill down to the, uh, to the level of single, single data records and this is something that we can show. Okay, thank you. Further questions from the audience? Yeah, this, I'm sorry, yeah. um, this MISPLUS uh, tool chain you presented, mm -hmm. uh, did you develop it for specific industry partners or is it basically available off the shelf as well? Can it be bought or, or used in 
other companies. Um, this is how our group works, is that we develop, basically, when we develop new visualization techniques, like, for example, the, this BLAS technique that we showed, or just the tissue-based framework, or also weightlifter. Basically, each of them is motivated by a particular application in from a particular domain. Like, for example, this tissue based framework was motivated from the energy sector. But we always try to transfer this uh, technique already when we're designing it to other applications as well. Yeah? So we kind of try to abstract it a bit. And for example, when you uh, uh, look at the industrial video that I just put the link on, you will see that this BLOS technique used for uh, giving an overview uh, of uh, industrial measurements exceeding, for example, target um, Seeing the target bounds, yeah? uh, which is not really related to data quality actually, but still, nevertheless, uh, was an application scenario that really managed very nicely this technique. Yeah? So, we, the short answer is yes, we designed this particular with, uh, tasks in mind, but we try to generalize it as soon as possible. But could you buy it now if yeah. there's enough money with it? Uh, <laughs> that was the second yes. question, I guess. Yes, <laughs> uh, so basically, it's we do actually we do yeah, more project acquisition is part of our business at Neovis, and uh, typically when uh, when a new company approaches us, uh, the first thing I try to persuade them is to give us some sample data, yeah, um, and some small uh, description of background of this data and to see what we can make uh, of this data with our tools. There are certain tasks like for compression modeling that we can address quite neatly and others where we are not so good at yet. And uh, for example, currently we are uh, developing a new tool for decision, uh, for decision trees. It's a classification task but not yet so well supported for a tool that we try to gradually uh, expand the scope of what uh, tasks we achieve for and after the box. So you're basically interested in a sort of cooperation with an industry partner. If an industry partner was interested in that, just the tool itself, uh, you still, you will not just give it away for a certain amount of, of, of money, but you prefer a, a sort of a cooperation to model the data together. And mm, no, 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 no. Uh, Basically, we do both things. Yeah? Okay. So uh, we do licensing, yeah, yeah? but uh, we not so much of the explore system as a whole because our experience showed that this did not really work in the past. Uh, but rather, with respect to, for example, a, third, a set of dashboards that make that match the uh, application context. For example, in the energy sector is exactly what we do. We have a kind of standard product called visuals, yeah, that comprises something like 10 dashboards. <coughs> this is basically uh, licensable out of the box. Mm -hmm. yeah. Partly to companies that we personally have never spoke to. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, we have the ongoing collaboration where we really uh, work together with the uh, with end users and experts. And uh, this gives us the input for, for development. Okay. Alexander? Yes. Um, in in uh, the, the regression feature selection, mm -hmm. uh, what is plotted next to the, to the feature names? I did not understand. Uh, uh, is this a data over time or um, so the, the, the video, I think? So on, on, on the on the left side you have temperature and, and, and the bottom next to temperature for example is this data over time or uh, no uh, so basically the actually the temperature basically this is a bit misleading because the temperature is actually the x-axis because this is the independent variable and all of these plots have the uh, target uh, that you want to model. In this case, it's gas consumption plotted on the y axis. Oh, okay. yeah. So basically, all of them have y uh, temperature, uh, the gas consumption on the y axis, 
and on the x axis there it's discretized the various uh, features that we see. If you have some impact on the distribution. I have a follow-up question to this. So you showed that the user needs to select the function like x x square. Wouldn't that be a case where you overburden most of the users? Or uh, they... Yes, I agree. Um, but uh, actually, as yes. we had, we chose <laughs> linear models here in this case. Uh, but we also have other types of models, like for example, neural networks, uh, where you typically don't have to choose explicitly to set some model complexity. Yeah. Um, so there, it's really sufficient to say add feature and. Uh, it's accounted for, so I need to specify some density. But you don't try to find the best complexity of the model for the uh, simplest model with the best performance? <clears throat> no, uh, because it's, uh, no, we don't do anything like this. Okay, further questions? No, if not, then. Thank you, Harald, again. Yeah, we will send out an announcement for the next speaker, which is in um, April. We don't know, we don't have a date yet, uh, but you will get an email. And um, I hope you join us again. And thanks again for coming. Thank you, Harald. And yeah, have a nice day.